in three, two, one. And hello and welcome to yet another episode of C++ for game programmers who want to do game programming and other things good too. Um, right, so welcome, welcome Boku D back in the house because he hasn't been here for a while. Uh, Luke and uh, Cynic, the uh, the regular. Mm -hmm. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, templates, templates, and I actually have two lectures prepared for today. Well, kind of like two 10-minute lectures. One of them is on function templates, and then the other one is on class templates. So I want to get, you know, start a little bit easy and then kind of build up the difficulty. So I'll do the I'll do the, te uh, the theory first, right? So I'll just tell you, you know, like the background information of what templates are and how to, how to define and terminology around it, uh, because, you know, sometimes you're you know, you're trying to talk to somebody about templates and they're like, what you talking about, Willis? Um, so we'll start with um, function templates first. And uh, okay, that's the lab. Um, right, so just starting off, uh, welcome, C++ for Games course. Uh, There's actually a course, uh, lecture content that I'm developing for a course that should be launched uh, or, you know, run in September 2023. So. The date on the slide says 2022, but, uh, you know, I prepared it last year and um, every year I have to update the slides with uh, <laughs> 2023. But anyways, um, you're getting a sneak peek and hopefully uh, you guys can provide some feedback and I can make some improvements before we actually run the course in September. Uh, but we'll see uh, how it goes. All right. So again, uh, you know, in this lesson, uh, we'll learn how to create uh, generic functions that can work with multiple different types. Um, yeah, I will say up until now, because this is a series of lectures. So up until now, you've only written functions that work for a specific parameter type. Uh, and function templates allow you to write functions that work with uh, many different types. This is useful because we may want to create a function that works with, for example, both 32-bit and 64-bit integers, or single precision and double precision floating point types. And instead of rewriting the same function for all the different possible combinations of parameter types, we can let the compiler generate the function uh, based on the argument types. So that's basically what templates allow us to do, right? You probably knew that already, so let's get into the more interesting details. The definition of a function template starts with the keyword template, as can be seen on the slide here. The keyword template comes above, uh, well, not above. Actually, it doesn't really matter, but as a you know, general rule of thumb, I just put the template signature above the function so that the rest just looks like a regular function. But, you know, C++ is white space agnostic. You can remove all the white space you want and put everything on one line. <laughs> Somebody did that in their intake assignment. It was hilarious. But anyways, uh, you, so you don't have to put the template uh, keyword above the function like I'm doing in this example here. The template type parameters are denoted using the type name keyword followed by a unique parameter name. In this case, we use T to den denote the type of the function parameters and the function return type. T is a very common template parameter name, but it's not a required name. We can use any name for the template parameter as long as the name is a legal type name in C++. So you can literally call it type if you want, uh, but yeah, T is a pretty standard name that we use for parameter types. Given the function template defined in the previous slide, the function template is invoked just like any other function. In this case, the compiler will automatically deduce the template arguments as float values because the function is invoked with the float argument types, as can be seen here, right? A and B are float, and then we call the max function which has this definition here, with two float types, which will deduce to a function that takes two float parameters and returns a float parameter. Simple, right? Yeah? You guys still hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So far, so good, right? No questions up until now? No. Nope. Nope. All right. So when the compiler is unable to deduce the template type arguments, uh, for example, when mixing template argument types, you can explicitly specify the template arguments. 
each explicit template type argument is uh, are placed in angle brackets after the function name. So in this case, the float argument a is implicitly converted to double when invoking this function. So we can specify, we can force the compiler to use a particular type. Uh, in this case, we want the max function to deduce to a double type, um, even though the parameter a is a floating point type. All right, so if we just uh, try to get it to deduce by not specifying the type like we did here, the compiler would give us an error or a warning, be, or an error actually, because it wouldn't be able to deduce the template argument type if you, you were mixing the template argument, uh, sorry, the uh, parameters passed to the function. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense, but maybe you're like, can you explain that a little bit more detailed? I think it makes sense. I would say more, but I'm muted right now because my mic is terrible. Okay. Yeah, just uh, use a uh, Morse code or something. Beep, 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 beep. Just kidding. All right, anyways, okay. another way. Sorry. Oh, I said that would work. That would work, yeah. All right, so another way to convince the compiler to automatically deduce the argument types is to cast one of the function arguments to the desired type. In this case, we'll use a static cast to convert the floating point argument to a double. This allows the compiler to, do, to deduce the template argument in the case that will both be double, right? And the return value C will be a double. Um, in this case, what is the value of C if we look at this slide? Uh, the value or the type? The type. A double? It's also a double, yeah? Because if we look at the template, right, the, the return value here, let me just put on my laser pointer. Hopefully this shows up. Laser. You see the laser? Right? Okay. So the return type T is also uh, the same as the template argument type. So if we rely on deduction or uh, explicit deduction or explicit template argument, then the return value here, T, will be also double which makes C a double. In this case, what is it? I mean, the answer is here, right? It's a float. Yeah, it's a float in this case because all the template parameters are floats, so the return type will also be a float. Right, good. Okay. Um, the previous issue with mixing the function arguments can also be solved by providing more template type parameters. In this case, another template parameter, uh, parameter u, is defined for the second function argument. Now we can mix different types of parameters and still allow the compiler to deduce the template type arguments. But what about the return type? Should it be t or u? If t is a float, for example, and u is a double, then this will result in a narrowing conversion. You know, when a wider type is being converted or narrowed down to a narrower type. How can we avoid the narrowing conversion? Well, of course, I'm going to tell you on the next slide. In order to avoid the narrowing conversion that could occur from the previous example, we can use the auto keyword for the return type of the function template. This allows the compiler to automatically deduce the return type based on the return expression. And in this case, the template return type will be either T or U, whichever is the wider type. Right? Because... Is it the whichever is the wider type, though? Uh, yes. The compiler will do everything in its power to prevent narrowing conversions. Yeah, but wouldn't it like be a float if A is a float and it needs to return A and like a double if it returns B? Yes, but when are the parameter types evaluated? At compile time or runtime? Sorry, the parameter result. Yeah, the result of the return expression. When are they did you when are they evaluated? That would be compile, compile time, time, I think. Only, uh... Yeah. So you won't know at compile time what the values are. You only know what the parameter types are. So the so compiler has no... picks the biggest one then? Yes. It has no oh. choice. It must choose the, the wider of the two. This is actually a pretty strange usage. Wouldn't it make more sense to either explicitly return C or U? Um, How? Instead of auto? 
how can you why, well how would you know which one is the wider type let's say if the t is a float u is a double but then i call the function again where t is a double and u is a float oh, how no, do i, I know mean, when changing the changing the function definition to explicitly return uh type a or b yeah well in this case it doesn't make sense i guess because they're both not well, it'll return it'll return a if a is greater than b otherwise it will return b Right. Yeah, we can specify do... the return type as either T or U, right? How? I mean, of course, I can say T, but I can also say U. But how do I know which one is the wider type? Yeah, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about here. I just kind of mentioned like it's strange to use auto as the return type for a method like this, but I guess it makes sense here. Yeah, I mean, this could be integers because because it could be chars, it could be floats yeah, and yeah, doubles, sure. it could be any mixed types, right? <laughs> So how can I know when I write this function which one is going to be the type that is the wider of the two? Without... Actually, that also makes me wonder, um, since this is evaluated at compile time, if you use, uh, let's say, a char and a float and a long with this method, will it just, based on usage, call different versions of it? Yes. So you wouldn't get the a long or whatever when you use it with a char, right? If one of the parameters is a long and one of them is a char, yes, the uh, return type will be a yeah, long. Yeah, that would be uh, a long, of course. Mm -hmm. It'll be the wider of the two. And so long is usually wider than a char. Right? So whether it's in T, whether it's in U, you know, if one of the uh, T is long, U is long, whatever, the return type will yeah. be the wider of A or B, whatever it is. Yep. So yeah, auto uh, allows you to basically use uh, auto type deduction. Um, that is available in uh, C++ 17, I believe. Uh, if it was C++ 20, I would have put a note in there. So I think it was 17, because C++ 20 is still considered like the newest standard. So I would have made a note of it, I think. Or not, I don't know. Okay. So depending on the type, I mean, these, these might not be primitive types. So you might actually be using this with complex types. So this would, in most cases, result in T and U being copied by value. For primitive types, this is not a problem. But for other types, you might want to avoid the expensive copy operation and the requirement that the type T is copyable. Uh, so we can avoid uh, copying uh, values um, by um, by using const references. Um, so suppose we want to allow our function template to be used with more uh, more complex types than just primitive types. Uh, as you are aware, passing an argument by value creates a copy of it. And if we want to avoid any unnecessary copying of function arguments, we can use the pass by reference uh, semantic instead. Uh, now that the function template can be used with both primitives and complex types without creating any unnecessary copies. But what about the return type? <laughs> this is where it gets fan uh, funny. The auto keyword never deduces a constant or a reference. And in this case, even if we return a const reference, this will always be returned by value. So how can we avoid the copy on the return type? We can't just make a con this a const reference. If T const and U are... Reference? Sorry? Anything? const auto reference just just listen for a second <laughs> uh, right how can we question. we can just make this a const reference right oh yeah but if t and u are different types then there's a good chance that the return value will need to be converted to the wider type well, this will inadvertently result in a temporary copy that only exists on the stack and you should be aware that returning a reference to a temporary can lead to no good right so just making this a const reference Right, if A and B are both reference types, then it will return a reference. But which reference, which type will it be? And if it, if for example, uh, the wider type is U and A is larger than B, then it will return a reference to A of the wider type, which will force it to create a temporary on the stack. And a temporary to a reference, eh, not cool, right? You probably don't understand the problem until you run into it once. It's not fun. <laughs> It's well, it's not fun, but like understanding why it this has happening in this code is also a little bit like what? Because you really have to see the deduction rules for the ternary operator, right? 
and how it deduces this auto parameter. Even if we made this a reference, we could in, you know, end up shooting ourselves in the foot. C++, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. All right, anyways, um, but let's look. To illustrate this, let's, uh, let's uh, okay, to illustrate the problem with the return type, let's instantiate the max function template with the std string type. Depending on the size of the string, it can be quite expensive to make a copy of these strings uh, on the stack. And to avoid the copy, we can see that we can change the parameter type to const references, but the return value will be copied since auto never deduces const or references, right? So if we had this and we called the function with a string, it would get deduced into this. And this would end up making the copy of the return value. Okay, so we want to avoid this, right? We want to avoid the copy by value. So how can we tell the compiler to return the correct type based on the context? Well, we can use the uh, decal type auto as the return value for our function template, which allows the compiler to deduce, deduce the return type correctly. When both A and B are the same type, the return type will be a reference, to, uh, a reference, and when A and B are different types, then the result will be returned by value, which is exactly what we need. So if we call this function with both uh, A and B uh, as the same type, then it's very safe, it's perfectly fine to return one of them as a reference because we know that the lifetime of this object should exceed the lifetime of the function, right? Because they're both references and they're both strings, so safe. Um, if they were different types, then uh, this would be deduced as a value, right? So because if it needs to cast or convert one of the types to another value or to another type, sorry, then it will result in a pass by value or a return by value, which is also safe. Okay, so decal type auto to deduce uh, the return type properly uh, based on the past in parameters of T and U. And what if you have one uh, string type and one const string reference type? Or is that impossible? Uh, yeah, if you rely on uh, template type deduction, both parameters will, their types will be deduced, but since we add const reference directly to the types, then they'll always oh, right. be passed by const yeah. reference. Okay. And because of constant reference collapsing rules, even if T and U were const reference types itself, they would collapse into a single const reference. Yeah, something about const, const collapsing and reference collapsing. So you can't, you, for example, you could say const, 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 T, ampersand, 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 ampersand. The compiler will just collapse that into const reference. Right? Because he's like, okay, we I know what's a reference. We had a discussion about that today, right, Lasse? Well, it wasn't much of a discussion. Well, true, but why? Like with the double, uh, the double const in the <laughs> the function parameter. Yeah, they, the, those are different const again. Like that's not. Is that, that not apply here? Okay, whatever. We'll. we'll... Yeah, Never mind that. it depends on the side of the reference symbol that the const. No, well, for references, that's not the case. For pointers, there is a difference yeah, between. Yeah, we were talking about a const pointer const. Pointer. Yeah. A const pointer to const data, right? So if it's a const on the left, then the data is const. If it's a const on the right of the of the asterisk, in, in the case of pointers, then the pointer oh, itself is const. No, I see what. Yeah, okay. Never mind. That you can put the const sense. on both sides. Then you have a const pointer to const data. Neither the data nor the nor the pointer can change. Yeah. But references That's can't be changed thing. anyways. Yeah. You cannot yeah, modify a reference after. Reference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the only. For references, this is the only way you can specify const. Putting it on the right side of the const might either A, ignore it, or B, generate an error. Yeah. But for pointers, it definitely matters. But if you have const, 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 const on the left side of the reference or the pointer, it will collapse into a single const. OK. Right, so um, C++ 20 introduces abbreviated function templates, they're called. Uh, simply put, the template parameters can be replaced by the auto keyword and the function parameter types are deduced automatically based on the arguments passed to the function. Um, so as you can see, the, oh wait, 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 wait. okay. So um, this is the same as a template parameter and both A and B will be deduced to whatever type they are. Right, so if A is a double, B is a float, well, that's what they'll be when you when the function is generated. 
That's why, again, we use decal type auto because we can deduce the correct type based on the past parameters and the return value. Yes? Uh, what if we need to know the type of one of the parameters? Um, for example, let's consider a function template that swaps the two values. In order to perform the swap, we need to store the value of A in a temporary. Uh, then we can use the decal type again to deduce the exact type of A. But there's a problem here. Uh, if we run this function, we'll see that both parameters get set to the same value. But why? What is A's type? Right? So what is A's type? A is a, const, uh, a non-const reference type. It has to be because we want to swap the two values around. So we cannot use const auto, right? Mm -hmm. But what does decal type A actually result in? Also a reference? Probably. Uh, it's nice to know that we can use decal type to determine the type of an argument when using the abbreviated function templates, but unfortunately, decal type maintains both const and references of the original type. So indeed, it would be, it would have deduced to a um, to a const ref or sorry non const reference. So then we're, we're just pointing to the same variable, and we're ended up ended up setting both of them to the same value. So there are several uh, ways to course. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. You, you you would want to use decal type if you want to like keep the reference then exactly it's, it's, yep yeah if it was a reference initially but you can also just like we're doing on the parameters just implicitly put or explicitly I should say explicitly put the ampersand on it if you if you want to guarantee that it will be a reference type you use decal type if you want to use the exact type of the template parameter. Yeah, it's more like inside for more for use inside templates than right. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Where you don't know, you know, you need to do, you need to create another variable of the same type or something else. So you need to like, what is the declared type of this variable? Then you use decal type. <clears throat> All right, but, and okay, so there are several ways to coerce the temporary variable to be a value type, but probably the simplest way is just to use auto on the temporary variable as well. So unlike decal type, auto ignores both constness and references of the original value being assigned. So now the swap function behaves as intended, but the cost of the three copies is be, uh, at the cost of three copies of that variable me being made. First, A is copied into temp. Then the copy is made be, uh, when B is copied to A. All right? Then another temp when co uh, it's copied to B. So how can we avoid these potentially expensive copies? That's something to think about. How can we avoid these? Well, okay. So this will result in um, copy semantics, right? So there's another type of semantic. What's the other one called? Recent since C++ 11. I would say recent. It's recent to me. I mean, for you guys, you probably never heard of. Uh, move, I guess. Move, move semantics, exactly. Right. Uh, All right. So great. it's probably a little bit of an advanced topic and I don't really want to get into this too much detail right now, but how much or how this works is exactly, but if you really want to know, don't skip this slide. Okay. As we saw in the previous slide, uh, we could swap two values by creating a temporary variable, variable copying the value of one into a temporary and then copying the original value to the other and then finally copying the temporary to the original. A oh, few, that's a lot of copies, right? And if the values that we're, uh, we're swapping contain gigabytes of data, this would be quite an expensive operation. But what if we could just move the data into the temporary instead of copying it? So maybe you don't know what a move is yet, but uh, <laughs> what is a move, you ask? Well, this is just the, this is the complicated part. A move usually consists of just transferring a pointer to the other underlying data. In the case of very large data, this is extremely efficient because the only thing you need to copy is the address of that data in memory, which is usually just a 64-bit integer. Obviously, not all types can be moved. For example, there is no added value in moving primitive data types. Moves and uh, move semantics are usually reserved for complex types that manage dynamic memory, like STD strings. I will talk about the difference between copy and move sem semantics later at another time, but for now, uh, let's just, it's just good to know that this is a thing. So this is our perfect swap, almost perfect swap. I think there's a, actually a better implementation of the swap function. 
Whew, that was a lot of information. Um, so about function templates that has been covered. Um, so let's review. So you you learned how to define a function template. You learned about template type deduction and the auto return type deduction. You also learned about decal type operator, which can be used to deduce the exact type of a variable. And you also learned how to use the abbreviated function templates to define templates more succinctly. And you learned a little bit more about move semantics and how they can be used to avoid expensive copies. If you want to learn more, and I know you do, about function templates, I recommend you read chapter 10 of the beginning C++ from novice to professional. Additionally, you can also consult the C++ language reference on function, function templates on cppreference.com. All right, that was it. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, so you've been using type name for templates, right? But uh, there's also like other ones, right? Uh, you can use class, right? That's also one? Yep, that's, you can. Yep. Yeah, that's optional. And that's I, just... I find it ambiguous. So I was, you know, if you have a complex type, uh, you might be tempted to use class, but the keyword type name actually has, you know, there's no different meaning and it's not ambiguous. Yeah. Isn't it that like class doesn't allow like simple types or can you no. still like pass in? No, no, no. Oh, no. So, it's so this, it's no difference? It's no difference at all. Okay. No discernible difference. But if you prefer, yeah, if you prefer class in the template argument, go ahead. I prefer type name because that's what it is. It's, you're basically naming a type. It feels and like it's, a relic of compiler differences. Yeah, it's a, it's not a class all the time. So you can use class, but it's not a class. It's a type I name. I mean, it can you can use it to like make your codes more, make the intentions clear, I guess. If you want, if you were saying this has to be a class. Yeah. Sure, you can do you. I'll do me. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally yeah. up to you. You can oh, also oh, just oh, use oh, the oh, right. You can just use abbreviated types and then no type name, no no class, whatever. No template arguments at all. Just use the abbreviated template to auto type deduction. I wouldn't do that personally, but yeah, this feels weird. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it is. If you, for example, if you do need to specify types or uh, like. In this case, we needed a temporary variable to store the value of A. Uh, and if A and B are not the same types, then the move or copy might actually, well, if it fails, you'll get a compiler error. Like if it's not a convertible type, you know, but mm, hopefully you don't try to swap two variables of completely differing types, although they may be implicitly convertible to one, and one or the other. Ugh. So generally it's safe to do a like this, right? But okay, yes, indeed, class is uh, is valid for the template argument uh, types. Any other questions? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, well, if you don't mind getting into it, I'm kind of curious as to how move actually works. Uh, how move works? Okay. Um, it doesn't even exist, but situations like let's say you have some data at some location and some data on another location and you're trying to move it but you have like five different pointers all pointing to that location how does yeah, that do you work? mean like the implementation or like how it works like for the compiler or like the 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 software how it works for like at a lower level yeah all right so it might be useful to show for example a like very simple um string class or something like that oops properties no uh, i want a new add new item i'll, I'll just make a class because it'll also create a header file and a cpp file for it uh, let's call this a uh, string with a capital s so it doesn't conflict with the standard template type nice all right so uh let's suppose, suppose we have this class called string and we want to store some private data to um, is that no I'm just thinking is that a good way to do it uh, obviously it can't be let's make it an unsigned size actually you know what we'll stick to more 
standards. Standard type. Uh, this is technically in the standard template namespace. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's in utility. Sure. Um, all right, so we have a string and a string, we can construct it, which just basically makes the data pointer null and the size zero. We can uh, uh, create a copy or not a copy. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, const string reference always pass uh, copies by str uh, const ref uh, and just call it copy just to be clear about it. And we have a string where we can uh, pass um, oh, const star star string. Um, and we don't need the size because <laughs> it's null terminated null string. Terminator. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to say it. Banny's not here, but uh, <laughs> God damn those null yeah. terminators and taking up one character of my string. But anyways, um, what else? What else? What else? Okay. So let's move that right. up. Can I move that up easily? Okay. And uh, yeah, of course, but I'm just wondering if we need anything else. So I'm, I'm going to rearrange these because we have, this is copy semantics, and we'll have a move semantics, move semantics. And move semantics look very similar, but they're not const because we need to, um, I don't know if I can use that one. Yeah, can I? Yeah, sure. Uh, sometimes I call it other or whatever. What's it complaining about? Move constructor does not have, yeah, all right. Because this shouldn't throw exceptions. So it's asking me to say, just make sure your market no exceptions. It should not throw exceptions. So, okay, fair enough. Yeah, you're right. It shouldn't. Because I don't need to allocate. throw exceptions? Because you don't allocate. It's basically just a move. Or sorry, it's like a you're moving a pointer from one place to another. So if this string class was successfully allocated, this one you're moving in here is just definitely successfully allocated. You shouldn't be doing anything that could throw an exception. You don't need to allocate memory, nothing. You're basically just moving it from one place to the next. Huh. All right, so then we can have some other functions, but for the sake of this exercise, we don't really care what those other functions are. Okay, now let's go to the CPP file and implement these things. First, we will implement the default constructor. Always a good idea, right? And I think I can just do this with Visual C++. And, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to default this. And then we don't need that. And then we can specify this as null, null pointer. And we set the size initially as zero. Uh, there is, um, yeah, in C23, there is a postfix for size D types, but for now, we'll just use it unsigned. Sorry, what was your question? Uh, I was saying you can do it directly as ULL, right? Or does that not That's work? Just, yeah. Long, long, right? The thing is, it's only ULL on 64-bit. And on 32-bit, oh, it's, it's a standard integer. It's 32 bits. So size T is really about the maximum memory address that you can store. So I'll just use unsigned because whatever. Right. It's good enough. I can also do something like this, I guess. And I guess it will just... Can you Maybe I'll... just do zero and it should like to do the type? I think that's just no. the best option for no. here. Zero oh. is an integer, signed integer, right? So if you say, oh, okay, you can't really see it. But just you by itself is a signed integer. So we could do this. I guess that will work. Oh. All right. And then we don't have to actually define the constructor. We can just get rid of that. Wait, isn't size T always platform specifically going to be defined as like a 32 or 64 bit unsigned integer anyways, or? Doesn't have to be unsigned actually. It is, but what is the literal? What is this? If I just do zero, what is the this literal? Is it an integer? Is it a 64 bit integer, 32 bit integer, eight bit no integer, idea. signed integer, unsigned integer? It is a signed I integer. Hope, I would hope right. that the compiler knows that that's not what we mean, but I guess not. I like to be really explicit with it. And since with size yeah. T, it's dependent on the platform or the architecture, I should say, 
Um, I'll just leave it as this because this guarantees that the entire value is initialized to zero. Yeah, that makes sense. Should be. And this should should initialize this to no pointer. I guess, but okay. So let's first do the uh, this one. Um, and we can't just assign the pointer. Well, I guess we can. Um, no, we can't. No, because we don't own the memory. Let's copy it. Right? So yeah. we need to know uh, how big it is. So for that, we need... Oh, what was the value? Size is equal to... Uh, uh, string lang. Uh, string lang. I think it's called string lang. Yes. But it's... Where is it? There In uh, it's string. Sure, sure, sure. And then a uh, string, right? And then we need to allocate this. So this will be um, excluding the null character. So then we need to make our, what is it called? Data. New char size plus one plus or one. including the null terminator. Wait, why do you want to have the null terminator in your string class? Because if, because you're want, also... if I want to print it with IO stream, then it will need that, right? Because IO stream just takes a right, char star right. and pretty much assumes that there's an null terminator in there. Pretty much anything. So printf, everything requires that string to be null terminated. So it's good to know the size because then I know how big I need, how much memory I need to copy, but... Yeah. Right. All right. So allocating the buffer doesn't exactly um, initialize anything. So the new char, whatever. Oh, speaking of this, I'm definitely going to need to have a destructor. Otherwise, chaos ensues. Which I'll implement that as well. Um, and then we need to, mem we can do a mem copy. That's the easiest way, I guess. Mem copy. Uh, I could do a secure one, but screw it. I don't care. Data sources string. Um, this is not clear what this is. Oh, uh, what? Val? What the hell is that? I'm going to have to go to the docs on that one. If only you had guess of copilot. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I do have it, but <laughs> I disabled it because it's super annoying. Fair enough. It's an alias for the, okay, whatever. Uh, C is the last character to copy. What? The last oh, character? God. And count is the number of characters. It's the last character. Okay, oh, so I guess that's um, size and uh, size plus one. I don't know. Just keep it size. And the types are different. So this one's an integer. And the other, last one is actually expecting a That's size so T. weird. The last character to copy. Wait, mem C copy? Aren't you using the wrong? Oh. Yeah, yeah geez. Uh, mem copy. Yeah, thank you. Doi. I'm like, what the fuck? I've never seen this before. That's yeah, right. That yeah. Makes sense. So we'll just copy that data in there. And then we'll set the uh, data at um, size minus one to the null terminator. As a single character. Plus one, right? Like, no. Minus one. Yeah, because... That's um, the MD, right? Oh, wait, no. Actually, no, it shouldn't be. Oh, one wait, but you did size because, plus one. Yeah. Size. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did it on the data type, not the size of the string. So the last character will be set to the null terminator in this uh, array. Okay, good. I think we have a good string initializer. Um, so that required an allocation here and a mem copy so okay fine i mean that's a necessary evo we got to do that all right so for this one we basically got to do the same thing um our data hasn't been initialized so we don't have to worry about like cleaning up any data but we do have to make a copy uh copy the data and the whatever so then we go uh let's see data we have to allocate uh oh well, first let's set the size size is equal to copy dot size so if we um what did we set it to yeah so that's without the null terminator 
And then we have this new this as well, char size plus one. It's been so long since I've used new. <laughs> and mem copy, not mem c copy. Uh, destination will be data copy dot data and uh, size. Size plus one, right? Because you want to null terminator with it. Yeah, in this case, I guess I can copy it over uh, if we assume that the data contains the I null mean, terminator. I mean, you can also do that with the first one because string length already requires the null terminator, right? So it, right. it has to be the, You mean already. this string that's being passed in? We assume it has the null terminator? Well, it has to because the string length function requires the Won't null work terminator. without a yeah. null terminator, yeah. Let's assume that it's good. And then we can just get rid of that. Oh, okay. So much cleaner. So should I actually set this to size plus one right from the begin right from the beginning? Um all right, but that's it. That's actually, we don't maybe. No. No. Right. No. Uh no, it's fine. Let's just leave it for the example. I mean in your own implementations, you can, you know, change it whichever way you want. Okay, so <laughs> that is a hey, come on. That is a copy operation, so that requires again an allocation and a mem copy, right? Pretty obvious. Now, for move semantics, it's a bit more complicated, but basically we don't need to do anything. We just say size is equal to move.size and data is equal to move.data. That's it, we're done. Except are we? Because now no. the move function still contains the size and data that I've moved into my string. Yeah. So one additional step I have to do is move that size is equal to zero and move that data is equal to null pointer. I'm not deleting anything. I'm simply moving it into another string. Oops. Yes, so that is move semantics basically in a nutshell. Um, but you see for primitive types, nothing's being moved. It's basically just copying that primitive type, but we definitely need to reset that. Otherwise, size is not going to be correct for this null string. Is it right? actually like needed to set the size to zero as well? Like um, when when it moves, like you, I, I, doesn't it like expect the the move, the thing it moved to be invalid afterwards, or is that who, who expects the the user, right? The user, the user. But what if there's a library function that tries to print the string based on the size? Who knows what's happening in the implementation? So yeah, if size is representing the size of the data that's that's pointed to by the data pointer, you better set it to null or zero. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess. Because the string it points to is no longer <laughs> doesn't contain any characters, so it's definitely size is zero. Right? If you wanted to test this the string length, you go, okay, well, what's this yeah, yeah, what's the yeah, length yeah. of my null string? Oh uh, well, if I just use the size value, then it would be wrong because this this string is null null. But, so Yeah, no, no, I I kind of thought that like um it was like defined as like when you move something, it's like leaves the, the object in an invalid state. No, 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 that is not safe. That is not safe. Because look what happens now, because we're going to implement our, our destructor. And what happens if we try to delete a, a null pointer? Uh, that works. That works, right? Yeah. So it would be completely unsafe to leave it in a non-state state. The, the point pointers, because that will like affect the, the string. Right. It won't let do, let like, me the, ask the, the group the here. Variables. Let me ask the group. If the data pointer is null, would a size value greater than zero be correct or incorrect? Incorrect. I mean, it, it will be very incorrect, bad. that's not my point, but sure. It will be very yeah. incorrect, yes. So the Cynic, do we need to set size to zero? Down. Absolutely we do, because it would otherwise be incorrect. <laughs> that's the bottom line. The move Don't doesn't leave... invalidate the memory, so it's not deleted. It's not, it's okay. not deleted, not at all. No, the string that I'm passing to this function is in no way destroyed. The data that it points to is simply being moved to this string's data. That's it. 
this this is still a completely valid string. So if we leave it in a valid state and we want to check the length of the string and we get back something other than zero and the data has been moved to another string, it would be wrong. Correct? Mm -hmm. Do you do you agree? Okay. I mean, I also agree that it's like better, but it's that's but you're worried about the operation, the cost of setting a, an integer or a size no. decrement to zero. <laughs> no, just like thinking about if it like is actually like required as well. I mean, of course it's not required, but like something. I would do it. I would do it. Yeah. Why would it not be required? If you're a library writer, don't leave your data in a completely unknown state. Do not do that. Everything should be like preconditions, post conditions, everything should be valid, right? So if you have a string that's zero length and you have a size that's not zero, it's not good. Okay, so end of that discussion. But now do you uh, understand the differences between move semantics and copy semantics? So move, uh, yeah, move is much cheaper because you're just moving pointers. You're not allocating anything. You're not mem copying anything. Right, you just moving oh, pointers no, is super cheap. Works. Super cheap. Move applies to a class, so you're only m moving the class members, but that means that it's not gonna apply to some random pointer you have. But does that mean that if you have, let's say, uh, a test class which contains a pointer to a giant array in there, and you move it? And you have a random pointer to that, it's still going to work, of course, because that pointer still points to the same data because the data wasn't actually moved. Uh, sorry, one more time. Um, what I was worried about earlier is if you have a pointer to some random data that is a member of a class and you move it, um, that pointer is, of course, still going to work because the data wasn't moved, just the class instance members. So that was the under be a yeah. Problem. Just the underlying pointers are being moved to a different to, to a different instance of the class, yes. Yeah. Um, so let's see what happens. Um... Actually, what happens if you uh, default the move constructor? Is that the thing you can do? To default the move constructor. Okay, so if you want to, you can default this. That is a possibility. You can actually default every one of the uh, special functions. Yeah. So that's uh, pr um, default uh, constructors, parameterized constructors. Uh, no, you can't default pr parameterized constructors. Sorry. Um, but copies and moves and operators, uh, copy operator and ass assignment operators, which there are two. So let me just write those out. Because. Um, uh, let me just think, think, think. Yes, no. Uh, string operator equals, this is the const uh, operator. Other, I always call it other. Uh, this is a non-const operation. And then we have the move semantics, which are, which are very similar. But again, they just take the double referenced version. So these can all be de defaulted, right? So copy, move, this is the copy assignment operator and the move assignment operator. These are slightly different in that you have to delete the, the underlying memory before you do the copy or move. So for example, uh, we'd have to do this, delete data. We don't have to set size to zero because it's going to be changed anyways. Um, and then we have to allocate, uh, uh, we have to set size to the same as the other dot size and um, data has to be set to uh, char oops size plus one and then mem copy not mem c copy why do you keep this giving me that version of the function stop confusing really like me version right so that should oh, come on. Um, right, so this is almost identical in every way, except we have to make sure we delete the old data, otherwise we're going to get a memory leak. Um, 
And the move operator, oh, okay, uh, let's add that, no except, sure. Uh, again, we have to delete the underlying data because we're now gonna... Data, data. We're now gonna replace, right? So we'll just do size first. And data equals other dot data. And indeed, other dot size has to be zero. And other dot... Uh, has to be null. Null pointer, come on. I don't want to use null anymore. Stop popping up. I wish I could delete that auto thing. I mean, you can technically. It's a, it's a uh, macro. You can just undev. I can't undev it, but yeah, I mean from here, right? Because it's always going to come up. So pff, stop and just give me null pointer. No, null pointer. Because it matches better. But anyways, um. Right, so this is the same as the move uh, constructor, but we have to delete the underlying data. In this case, we didn't have any underlying data first, so but in the operator, we do. So when we do an assignment, we definitely have that. All right, so what happens here? What is this? Is this a move or a copy? It's a copy. Copy. Absolutely, it's a copy. Yeah. So this will result in uh, the old pointer being deleted in S1, um, a new one being allocated, and a mem copy. Okay. So how do we get it to move instead? SD move. STD move, yeah. So S1 equals SCD move S2. That's actually also a question I had. Like um, when you want to move an object, does it have to go through a function to be marked as like movable or is there like a way to do it in the function itself? Is there a way? Yeah. Okay, yeah, there is. It's uh, called a move constructor, right? How do you mm -hmm. call the move constructor? Well, it's just a method, I would say. Well, move constructor is maybe not the right word, but the... All right, let's try this. Let's try this. All right, so how do we... Let's say we want to use the move constructor to construct a new string. So S3. What do we do here? How do we, how do we enforce the move constructor? By somehow getting a double reference. Yeah, somehow that's that possible. Yeah, sure there we go. Do that. That, that oh, of my, course, yeah. My question, can you only get the double reference via a, a function, yeah. or is there a way to do it in right here? Yep. There you go. Copy this line. Oh, uh, my God. And put right, that there. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. That's all it does. It's one line of code. Yeah, all I, it does I, is I it that. takes... I, I some, somehow forgot about it. <laughs> Uh, so if we wanted to, oh my gosh, uh, if, if I wanted to not use std move, well, I can do, I can do this, set a cast string, there we go, that'll work, but does it okay. make it prettier? Eh. No, absolutely. Does it make it's it more, more, you know, just clear what is happening not. here? You, you uh, should, you should not use this. <laughs> I was I was more just interested in like, I mean, it's it works. It will do the exact same thing, but it's not more readable. Yeah. So just use. So I guess that te I technically this is still calling a function. So is uh. it? Is it? I I, I, what, I feel what like will happen in the functiony enough. What? No. What will happen in the bytecode? I mean, it will probably just interpret it differently, right? Exactly. No, no there's no inlining. No, 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 no. This is just the inter the interpretation is for compiler only. Which version of the function am I going going to call? This will result in either function uh, that results in a copy yeah. or the function that results in a move. That's it. This will boil down to no overhead, zero overhead. So you don't have to worry about, oh, it's still function call. No, it might be in debug, but in release, it boils down to calling the right function. That's it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I did. I didn't mean it as like an actual mm -hmm. function call, just more like it looks. Function yeah, it call, looks you know? like, in your there's a, in your text. I mean, I mean there's a lot in the of text of your function, CPP there's file. There's a lot of functions without like any overhead, so you know. Indeed, that's an, that's the kind of the magic of of templates as well, because the the compiler can you know if it can deduce the arguments, it can deduce the function, it can actually deduce what the function is doing, it can deduce what how much code yeah. is being invoked or generated by that function, and it can say, okay, well, there's three lines of code here. You know what? Calling the function is going to generate like ten lines of code. Why would I generate ten lines of call code to execute three? No, I'm going to just inline that for you and generate zero overhead. So unless there was some side effects with passing parameters to a function, which should not be the case, uh, the compiler is allowed to inline, even if you don't ask it to. It can happen at link time, even. Yeah. With link time code code generation, link time optimizations, uh, can also actually remove the function call. Because the code, it knows, right? It can look it up. It can then just replace the function call with the actual code that should be invoked. Yep. inside the function okay so yeah no std move this is the one and only way to differentiate between the move uh, semantics and copy semantics or copy and move semantics uh but my question actually had, hadn't been answered about like what happens when you default the move constructor like okay, what, so what does it generate what does it do in um <clears throat> the case where it was clear what would happen in the in the uh, parameters. It's safe to default. So if this was any standard template container type, strings, vectors, maps, lists, anything, they all define move semantics for those types. So if those types had defined well-defined move semantics, it would be perfectly yeah, but... safe to default them. Does a char star de clearly define move semantics? No, but that that's like no. the the question. Like, um, so how the co how it. will the compiler know to do this if I defaulted the move move operator, the move constructor? How would it well, know that, that, to do that's this? What I that's what I specifically wanted to know, like specifically yes. for the size, because I the way I see it, when you default a move constructor, it's just gonna do like a copy of the things. N no, it's not going to. It's not going to do a copy. It what it will do is this well yeah, I'm, what, yeah what, is I mean, this, what is this what does this mean like i'm getting the green underlines it's like what the, what do you mean oh. this is like this is a primitive type it's not doesn't make any sense and well what would it do to do this on the data type what would that do on a pointer like i'm getting the i'm getting the green underlines like dude this has no effect just don't don't do this it doesn't do anything this is just a copy of the pointer it won't set this to zero. It won't set this to null. It will just do this. And all that does, we've just seen, is that just does this. Static cast. God damn it. Yeah, Static so, cast so, to the so reference it, type. It does, it does like do a, a quote unquote default copy, but like it's just more convoluted in yeah. a way. Yeah. So more well, convoluted, incorrect. Exactly it will copy, be absolutely right? incorrect. Well, yeah, it, it it tries to move everything, but because there are yeah. default like basic types, they just get copied. They just get copied, That's but it doesn't know right? to yeah. set them to null. It doesn't know to do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I I know that like the that's like the problem. Like with with pointers, you basically can never default something because it rarely does that correctly. But other yeah. than that, if, you, like if, if your you class contains pointers, raw pointers, it doesn't know what to do with them. If, on the other hand, it contained a unique pointer, right? Yeah, it's also if this was a unique pointer, which I haven't the memory header file, but unique pointer uh, char, <laughs> or yeah, well. I should better said char array because that's really what it is. Um, yeah, I want the memory header file. Did it actually put it in here? No, it didn't. Okay, so isn't wait doesn't uh, taking a unique pointer of a char array doesn't that make it like a two-dimensional array? Isn't that like that? No. No. Doesn't... This just says that this is actually pointing to a, an unbounded array. 
Right, because in like normal C++ when you take like a pointer of a char array, you do end up with like a two double array thingy, right? Because you end up um, with like a pointer of a pointer. Yeah, and everything is going wrong here. Um, but anyway, so then we would have to, we could say uh, data is equal to make, uh, make unique, it should be std, make unique, make unique. And then, um, well, we already. And then, the, and then the parameter becomes the size. Okay, so then it's array. It's an array of chars. Hmm. Size plus one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> you know, I. I mean, you get it, right? It's not taking yeah. the the data. It's taking in the size of the array. So if it's an unbounded array, this parameter becomes the size of the array, not the actual data that should be filled into this pointer or something like that. It's not the pointer. So if I said I could do this, but then this should not be an array, and then this will break even more because I can't assign a non. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Yeah. Different. Different freaking lecture altogether so i don't want to get yep. into the details of this unique points your lecture or share points your smart points yeah. your lecture one that's a completely different lecture. subject yeah for sure Let okay you give that one it's 10 o'clock i'm going to take a quick uh, pause for a second and then we'll be back uh Okay, so we're back, and um, now we will get into class templates. So let me just start up this presentation here. You guys are still seeing my screen, right? Yes. So, so then now we'll uh, continue with uh, class templates. Um, right, so in this lesson, you will learn about class templates, obviously. And similar to function templates, class templates define a family of classes that can operate on many different types. As you will see in a later lesson, the standard template library, or STL for short, uses class templates extensively. And I want you to have a fundamental understanding of class templates before you are exposed to STL. Um, so disclaimer here, this is a series of lectures, so STL is coming later, but uh, not today. You will also learn about type and non-type template parameters. Uh, template specialization allows you to define a particular implementation of your class template given a specific set of template parameters. And variable templates allow you to define a family of variables. Uh, this is useful if you want to define some constant values whose type can be defined later in the program. Um, yeah, that's new in C20, the variable templates. Uh, we'll, so we'll see an example of that as well. Uh, we'll also look at type aliases and alias templates, and type aliases allow us to specify a shorter, easier to remember name for our class templates, and this will come in handy later when we're doing our vector class demo. All right, so declaring a class template is very similar to declaring a class, except a class template starts with the template keyword, similar to the function templates, followed by the template parameter list. Now, in this case, it appears I'm using a different uh, notation where I have template type name T, similar to function templates, but I keep it on the same line. Um, technically, I would have uh, added a carriage return there. Let me just put on my laser pointer. Right, you guys see the laser pointer? Amazing. Don't be distracted by the laser pointer. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible, I know. But anyway, so yeah, white space, no white space, it's up to you. The template, sorry? White space. White space, yeah. So in this case, I now have white space here, not? Uh, yeah. There I do, right? That was probably just to get it to fit on this uh, slide here. All right, so the template parameter list can contain three types of parameter types. The type template parameter, type name, non-type template parameter. In this case, we have a non-type template parameter here and a template template parameter, which is not shown here. Let's ignore the template template parameters for now and just look at the type and non-type template parameters. Type template parameters start with the type name or class for you, Cynic, keyword followed by the type name. In this example, I use the letter T to represent the type name. T is commonly used type name for type template parameters, but it can be any valid C++ identifier. The type name becomes an alias for whatever type is used to instantiate the class template. Anywhere you expect the type to be used, you can use T instead. 
And a non-type template parameter can be used to define some kind of constant value in your class template. In this case, n is used to represent the number of elements of the array. A non-type template parameter can be an integral type, like a Boolean, a char, an integer, or size t. In this case, it's size t. It can be an enumeration type. Uh, it can also be a reference or pointer to an existing object or function. Uh, or it can be a pointer to a member of a class, so a member function or a member variable of a class. For now, we'll just stick to integral types for the non-type template parameters. In this case, size t is an integral, depending on the type of uh, platform or architecture. Size t is 32 bits or 64 bits. Integer. And member functions can be defined either in the class directly or outside the class. Uh, but when defining a member functions of a class template outside of the class declaration, you must list all of the template parameters of the class template as shown in the code snippet. So here we have a, a template class called array, has two template arguments, and it defines a default constructor. If we want to define the, uh, the implementation of the constructor outside of the class definition, this is the class definition, we must list all of the template parameter names as the part before the double colons here, right? So this is the actual class type. So we must just, uh, define all the uh, template arguments there. We'll see more examples of this as we go on. So to allow the, the array class template to be used like a regular array, we can overload the subscript operator. Here we see the subscript operators, uh, both for const and non-const return types, uh, non-const and non-const reference or pointer types. If you recall from the previous lesson on operator overloading, okay, we missed that one, so I, <laughs> we didn't go to that one. But anyways, we must provide both const and non-const variants of this method. The non-const version returns a non-const of the first one, a non-const reference to the element in the array, and the const version returns a const reference. So this is the const at the end of the function determines the the uh, either constantness of the instance that we are uh, that we're working on. Okay, maybe you guys know that already. So this either allows the array elements to be written to directly when we have a non-const array or read only when we have a const array. Uh, and you may have noticed that the code duplication between the const and the non-const version. So here we have the non-const version, which, well, first just asserts that the value n is less than the number of elements in the array and returns the data. And the const version is identical. So unfortunately, we have two functions. This is called uh, code duplication, right? So uh, what we want to, okay, I'm going to say that later. Um, so we now have this code duplication. So ideally, we'd like to minimize the amount of code duplication. And the principle that we use is called dry. And dry stands for don't repeat yourself, right? Because we want to avoid duplication of code here. So, but in C23, and by the way, this is lecture for modern C++, so I'll introduce a new concept here called the deducing this feature to remove this kind of code duplication. So this is a little bit tidbit of C23, but, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt because it's, <laughs> it's a little bit weird, the, the notation here. If you're like me and I and immediately want to avoid this code duplication when we are defining both the const and const non-const versions of the array subscript operator, then you're in luck. Because in C23, a new technique to, to allow the compiler to generate both the const and non-const versions of the function has been introduced. In this case, it's called the deducing this feature. The problem is that the implicit this um, the, imp the this parameter to the function is a const pointer when invoking a const method, and in this case, we must return a const reference to the array element to prevent the data from being modified. But on the other hand, when we have a non-const array, then the implicit this parameter is a non-const pointer, and in this case, we can return a non-const reference. But to let the compiler generate the right functions for both the const and non-const versions of our class, we can add an explicit this parameter to our argument list. As you can see here, this self self, right? So that, again, the naming convention on the template parameter types 
uh, is really um, up to you. But this is what I got from documentation. All right, so all there, there are a few more cases where the the deducing this reference uh, or the deducing this feature um, uh, helps you to 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 do things. Uh, this code de -du deduplication is one of the most common use cases, and uh, the example also demonstrates that member functions of a class template can also have template parameters. So as you see here, the class is a template class, so it has template parameters, but the functions themselves that we define can also have template parameters. And when defining a member function template outside of the class, both the class template parameters and the function template parameters must be listed before the function definition. So here we get such a complicated thing. We have the class template parameters occurring first. Then we have the template, uh, sorry, the function template parameters, this one, the self ones. And we have to list them both because both the class and the function, you know, have template parameters. And they they have to be separated just like here, right? So separate, um, right? And this uh, this will this type deduction return value will be will be deduced to a const reference if the array is being used as const or a non-const reference if it's uh, being used as a non-const case. Okay, now we only have one implementation. So that but that was a bit of a sidetrack, and you know this is there was a nice thing. I was like, oh, I was looking at uh, the the operator. Um, the, the indexing operator here, and I, you know, I was thinking, there's got to be a better way. Why do I keep having to duplicate the code for this? And then I came across this uh, deducing deducing this feature in C++23, which will come to a compiler near you very soon. Actually, Visual Studio also implements this, so you can actually test this in Visual Studio. All right. Um, the declaration of a class template is not enough to get the compiler to generate any actual code for the class. In order for the class template to generate any actual code, it must be instantiated. So a class template is instantiated by providing template arguments for the class template, right here. So we will start you uh, instantiating the class type. Uh, the code snippet here uh, instantiates a four-element integer array, and in this case, only the default constructor and non-const array subscript operator methods are generated for the class. Um, any other methods that are not used, by the way, if you don't actually invoke any of the functions for a particular type of uh, class instantiation, will not be generated. They'll only get generated if you actually use them. In this case, we're using the subscript operator, and this will actually generate code for the subscript operator for the class matching these template arguments. This means that if there are any errors in your class template that you won't know until the member functions of the class template are actually used right so if you have compiler errors in there or something or whatever and the compile and the function never never gets instantiated you'll never know about those errors until you actually try to use it so just be aware of that but you can also quickly test if all of the member functions of a class template compile successfully by explicitly instantiating your class template with a given set of template arguments Doing this will cause the compiler to generate the entire class definition, including all of the member functions of the class. Although this is not a good way to test if all the member functions of your class template are semantically correct, you can at least check that they compile without any compiler errors or warnings. So somewhere in this, you know, anywhere, CPP file, whatever, they putting the template and then array int for whatever and ending the expression is enough to get the compiler to try to generate this 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 class, okay? All right, so specialization. Uh, so class templates can be specialized based on the template parameters. So for example, the code snippet on the left shows that an example of an array class template that is specialized for floats, or float arrays of undetermined size. So this is, uh, for example, uh, we, we keep the, the size of the array as a template parameter but we can specialize for floating point types by specifying float for the the type. Let's go back to this one here, right? So type name we can ex we can explicitly specify, but can we leave we can leave size n um, as a as to fill it in later. Uh, the second one, of course, is the uh, the 
the type is uh, a left to the user to determine, but the size is explicitly specialized on four. So if anybody uses a four for the, the number of elements, then it will explicitly, or it will, it will use this version of the class. So this is called partial template specialization. Uh, it is important to note that you can't just pick and choose which member functions of the class template you want to specialize. When you provide a partial specialization like this, you must specialize the entire class. Every member function, every member variable has to be redefined for the specialization. So sometimes it's not really practical, but I'll show you a workaround when we do the example with a vector class. There are techniques that you can use to reduce the amount of code that you need to rewrite for specialized classes. Uh, specialized class templates, which I will show you again in the, yeah, like I said, in the math module. Partial specialization is when only a few template parameters are specialized, and complete or full specialization is when all of the template parameters are specialized. And when you specialize all of the template parameters, for example, if I specify, a, you know, float and for, for both parameters, then I don't need template at all but I can just say, this is just a specialization for this particular type of template parameters, yeah? So that's actually useful in a lot of cases because, for example, vectors, for four component floating point vectors, you actually want to maybe specialize for SIMD operations. And you then need to specify that the SIMD operations only work on four component floating point types or four component doubles. Uh, yeah, so three component or two component vectors don't have the SIMD equivalents, so you wouldn't want to have SIMD overloads for, for those. So then you'll say, okay, only for these types we we'll have SIMD. Would you not be able to just use, you still use that with three component versions, but using like zero or one for the final mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, you can, yeah. That's totally optional. Right. Yeah. But I'll show you a reason why it makes the code more complicated, because there is no SIMD type for a three-component floating-point vector. So if you want to make sure that the size of the vector doesn't exceed the, the, the four floats, or th sorry, three floats, um, you can't use a union for the variables but okay then you'll always have to use copies right so copy the data into a simd register you know add a zero for the padding and hmm, code gets nasty but uh, i can show you an example um all right so summarizing uh in this lesson you learned about class templates uh you learned how to declare a class template you learned about the different template parameter types. So we have the type template parameters, non-type template parameters. I didn't talk about it, but we also have template template parameters. So when the actual template parameter type is a template itself. <laughs> you also learned how, how to define uh, member functions of a class template outside of the class declaration. And you also learned how to use the deducing this feature in C++23 to avoid code duplication. Uh, you also learned how to instantiate a class template and how to explicitly instantiate a class template to force the compiler to fully compile a particular class template. And finally, you also learned about partial and full template specialization, very briefly. If you want to learn more about class templates, I recommend you read Chapter 17 of the beginning C++20 book. And additionally, you can also consult the C++ language reference on class templates on cppreference.com. Okay, so admittedly, that was a lot of information um, very quickly. And are there any questions about this? Uh, well, not specifically about this, but um, what about variadic template arguments? Uh, very good. Uh, I, I will show an example of that. Yeah, so uh, in the lab, I guess we'll go to the lab now, the lab, I'll open up Visual Studio and we'll create like a vector class that we can use in a generic context. Is that okay?
Yeah, sure. And then I'll create one constructor that takes a phreatic number of arguments because, well, we may not know how big our vectors are. So, okay. Well, we'll see in a second. Yeah? Yeah. The variadic template arguments. Any other questions? No? Okay, let's go back to Visual Studio then. Uh, and this show. Like that. Uh, so we have a string class. Let's create a new class um, for our vector. Let's just call it vector for sake of, you know, you know, risking that we're going to call it the same as the std vector class. But since it's not in the std namespace, well, no worries, right? And we want to make this a template class. So we need two things. We need the type of the vector. And we also need the number of elements because we can have a two component vector. We can have a three component vector. We can have a four component we can vector. We can even have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If we want to create a generic vector class, we can have any number of elements in our vector. So instead of, are you, are you, you know, an array or a vector? A vector. So it's a vector. Re grow in size. No, because it's compile time defined. So static size. That's an array, right? <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, okay. Let me just bring up some uh, another example that I have. I'm going to bring it on the other side of my screen here. I have. Uh, uh, oh yeah, I can't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, I have it now. Where well, I've actually implemented a templated vector class. I'm going to use this as a reference. I don't want you to see it because it's uh, nasty code. I did share it before in the group in the channels, but uh, I'll just use it as a reference for myself. And you'll you'll right away see the, the problem with uh, specialization of vector types. Or of, sorry, of templates. Okay, so... Um, for our vector, uh, because we we don't know how many elements there are going to be in there, the only sensible thing that we can do here is to make this an element of, I don't know what we want to call this, V. I don't know what we're going to, it's V, well, let me see here. What did I call it in my previous implementation? Oh, vec. I call it vec. V, vec, whatever. So the underlying member variable is called vec. Um, do I want to make it public? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. In this case, I do. Um, and let's just do this because we also want to initialize all the members to zero anytime we have this. All right, so we can have a default constructor. No problem, not delete, default. Default. And, uh, well, we don't need a destructor, really, because it's, an, it's a static array. So it'll just be cleaned up with the class. No dynamic memory here. We, if we had dynamic memory, we would be, we would not, uh, we would not be cool. But the problem is now, um, that I also want to provide accessors for the individual elements of the vector. I want to provide an x, y, or perhaps if the if the vector represents colors, maybe I want parameters for uh, the red and green channels, uh, or red, green, blue, or red, green, blue, alpha. But since we don't know what the size of the vector is, we can't predict in advance which individual elements we'll have of the vector, right? So then we might like you might see something like this in other uh, in other math libraries where they create a union, and then we do something like uh, we have vec, but we also have a struct, an unnamed struct. Yeah, I know uh, Themper is not here, so who cares? Uh, and then we have right. How do we know? We don't know if there's x y. We don't know if there's x y. Z, oh geez, I can type. Uh, and we don't know if there's 
x, y, z, w. These are very common terms to be used for vectors, but we don't know n. So how can we fix this? If we don't know how many elements we have. Hmm? Tem template, speci template specialization, right? Exactly. Exactly. So for now, I'm not going to use a union for this. This is the, let's just say the base type. For the base, base type, we only have a vector. But if we know the size, then we could provide a specialization. Um, so to do that, we just go, right? We, we still don't know the type, but we do know the size. So class vector uh, T2. Right now we know it's a two element vector of type T. So now we can have a union unnamed. Let's keep it unnamed where we have struct unnamed again. So we don't have to actually name the structs or the unions to get to access the elements. And then we know we for sure have elements T, X and T, Y. And then we have an array. We'll call, keep the naming convention back. And this will be explicitly two elements because anytime we had n before, we have to replace with the actual size of the array. And we do the same for three element vectors. Right? You can see how this is getting a little bit cumbersome because if we had any function, so for example, if we have a constructor. We have to redefine it. In this case, it's not a problem because we redefine this as, um, well, no, we can't do this actually because it doesn't know how to initialize the variables because we're using a union. So now we have to explicitly state it. Same Can with this one. Default initialize a union. How? Just give one of the things the default initialization, I think. Like this? Work. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you think good. so? Okay, compiler will be happy with that. Okay, I, maybe. I, I think I I have used it before like that. I believe, but. Well, I find that in most cases, by defaulting uh, operations or functions with um, a union, with member variables that are a union in a union, it basically says I can't. I can't do this because you're using a, a union type for this member variable. I don't know well, how to it, default it. It starts complaining if you um, initialize all of them like separately, but once if you just initialize one that like spans across the entire union, then it should be fine, I think. <laughs> you think? Okay, well, let's just see what happens. Uh, we will instantiate, we'll use the template vector float to to force the compiler to instantiate these we do need to put this in a cpp file uh, so i will actually because header files are not compiled as you know so we will explicitly instantiate them here so let's say float to template vector i mean it might work i mean uh, if I just default it, it will just not initialize them, right? It'll just leave them in a completely bunk state. And uh, we'll explicitly instantiate for component vector. And we can do the same for doubles if we want, or ints, or chars even, or booleans, or whatever. Just to get the compiler to generate them and compile something. So if I compile that, um, all right, so then I get this warning. No suitable definition provided for explicit template instantiation request. And it's complaining about the default constructor. Okay, so that takes no parameters, right? So this one, and you're like, why? I didn't default initialize it. What, this one? No, the two. You you removed the brackets. Yeah, I did it also. Here's the two. No, no, down at the union, like it it can't default. Why not? Default it's says just don't do anything, right? Right, but yeah, no, yeah, like that, I guess. 
Oh, oh shoot, yeah. Okay, let's get rid of these. Uh, return star this. <laughs> Sorry, it has to return a reference, and that's why it was still squiggly. Not that I'm using the strings, but okay. Uh, okay, we don't have a main function. Did I have that in here? Let's just add a main just to get this thing to come because I think this is still set to now let's change it to why does it still create 132 we'll change this to a static library yeah. oh, we don't need a main don't need... okay so it generated the template didn't generate any warning so this is fine for, for this case but in most cases if you want to default something that you Probably, if in this case, I had problems with this in the past, so I had to explicitly implement it. But the problem gets bigger that we, if we want to do this. Um, so let's say we want to have an operator, a uh, generic one. So plus equals usually returns uh, a reference to the original vector. Um, and it takes a const reference to another vector. The other or actually my uh my right hand side so this one is the left hand side and the parameter being passed is the right hand side of the operator so let's implement that um yeah visuals uh c++ is nice and it will uh, generate this code for us I don't have to type this, but as you can see, we need to specify the template parameters and we need to specify the return type with the template parameters and the f class with TN and the function. So it, it gets kind of messy. Um, but zero I less than N. And then it's the vec i rhs vec i this is what the generic version would look like so this will work for n whatever doesn't matter and the comp compiler might even vectorize this for me so i wouldn't have to do it myself so that's nice Okay, but now I have a specialization of this. Um, so now I need to do it again for the specialization. Oh God, really? Yeah, really, 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 really. And imagine how many functions. You're gonna have a plus equals, minus equals, a, a unary, or not a unary, but a, um, just a single plus without the assignment, uh, minus, uh, any kind of operations you can perform on vectors, you have to duplicate in every version, every specialization of this, of this vector. As you can imagine, this gets pretty nasty. So let's get this generated again. So now I know what, what n is, it's two, but it's basically the same damn code. And remember what I said? What's the acronym I used before? Dry, don't repeat yourself. And what am I doing? Exactly that. I'm repeating yep. myself everywhere, and I need to do it again for three and four component vectors. And okay, I give up. This is terrible. The GLM is suddenly starting to make sense why they have their code so weirdly set up. <laughs> oh well, uh, GLM doesn't even do this, I think. So you know that they they specifically set it up so they don't have to like redefine it for every like um, specialization they have. Do they? Yeah, they, they have like template functions that they call inside the template specialization. It's like a whole thing. Um, like, again, meta programming. It's fun reading your compiler errors when you fuck something up with GLM. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, a good solution to this is to create a base class. <clears throat> It has the same template parameters as the original. And in this case, we'll call it vector base. And the only thing we'll have 
is the default constructor. And again, and you'll you'll see why this is useful in a second here. That's it. it. Doesn't have to have any operators or anything in it because the base class is purely for holding the data. Um, and in my implementation, I chose to do it like this instead of doing it explicitly here. Oh, sorry, this can't be type name. This should be size T. All right. And the green dots are like, oh, don't you mean to name it like this? Why not? Okay, I don't you believe you. You need to change it to line 11 as well, type name to size T. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now he's probably complaining about can be default calling a calling a special member function. No, he's, he's suggesting to use delete to prohibit calling oh. a special member function. But why would I? Oh. Whatever. I'm not going to do that. Mm. So we're just going to leave it like that. And um, now, if I want to specialize, it's very easy, right? I can just um yeah so this is the two let's just copy this no sorry let's copy this and then we'll specialize for the case where it is two then we can use the union with a struct an unnamed struct i know this is like an extension in C++, but whatever. Whatever TX and TY is. Move that into the struct. So now we can access the elements either via the X and Y parameters or via T using index parameters. So great. And let's do that for three. I do also have to implement the, uh, the constructor for these, but I'll do that in a second. But it's it's slightly easier, and you can imagine for four. I'm just going to leave it for for now. Um, but for two and three, yeah, uh, these are common. And now we explicitly construct the member, and it's going to complain still that like x and y are not being are not being initialized. But you know what? They are through the union. And why are you not just in, just using is equals to default? For the very reason I just mentioned, because I had issues with uh, structs in unions, and it would complain that it wasn't uh, initializing all the members, when in fact it was initializing it okay. through one of the members of the union, but not the other, uh, on some compilers. So Visual Studio might not have complained on it, but on, um, uh -huh. I think it was GCC or some other compilers, it did. All right, uh -huh. so now we have a base class, which basically just defines the data. That's it. And I can specialize on the data and provide the named variables for x, y, z, and if I had a three component, four component vector, x, y, z, w. And now I have to change my vector type to um derive from that vector base come on and that looks like this t and that's it that's all i have to do and now i can just get rid of these completely uh whoops not the operator <laughs> but i do want to delete the data because now the data is being accessed through the vector base class. Now let me just quickly look at the implementation of such a function. And do I, yeah, I do need to um, specify that the base class is Something like this. This is requirement now. 
Okay, so I always have to use the base class and then explicitly say I'm accessing it via the via the base class. Okay, um, now we don't know the size of the vector, and you were asking about variadic template arguments. So what we can do is actually provide. Um, well, we need type name. Um, let's see how I did this in the past. I think I, yeah, I th oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I used uh, any other type. So for example, it could be a type U, but whatever. Uh, let's go with, I have to keep looking at this. What, what did I do? Shouldn't it be like type name, triple dots, and then args? Uh, likely, yeah. Um, because the code I used before, I was using um, uh, constraints to constrain the types of the arguments being passed. So you could only use convertible types uh, to t so for example if you try to pass an std string here this would work now but if i constrain the types using a template cons template oh god what was the name of it template constraints let's just call them constraints uh, you can constrain the types and i'm trying to convert it from the constraint type to the standard template type so then it would be something like this Uh, I th think, yep, yeah, it's really confusing, this syntax, but uh, it would be something like this. And then we have a template argument, uh, which can take any number of, <laughs> any, any number of and type of arguments. So the implementation of this function is a bit whack. Let's see how it would go. Oops. See what it would look like because we need to determine the number of arguments being passed in the argument list. Oh, it's very confusing. It's really better to explicitly specify the arguments in in this case. Okay, let's uh, let's make a go with this. See if we can figure it out the implementation of it. Um, I think I can figure this out here. Base vec i plus plus. Bear with me. <laughs> equals args. Uh, something like that, but I, I had to do something really wacky to get this to work. You're so wacky. Yeah, no, because you have to expand the arguments, but you don't know how many are in there, right? So you, you, and you have to make sure you don't expand it to more than the size of the vector. So it's something like. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I have to explicitly specify. You know what? For this, I'm not going to do this. You, usually, you do this with uh, forwarding functions or forwarding forwarding arguments to a function. And Don't you usually call it recursively. So no, you can't call constructors recursively. So you could, uh, no, for example, I mean, call another function and then have it expand with the cursive arguments. And that works great for printing arguments to the console or whatever. Right. How would you do that? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that right now. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. 
I'm just looking at my examples. I'll, I'll just show you the example that I'm trying to base it on. But like I said, I'm using constraints. Uh, so this is this is a template constraint. So we ensure that the template parameters are convertible to the underlying type. So in this case, U must be convertible to T. Otherwise, we'll get an, an error. What was the concepts keyword? What's that? This is creating a constraint for a template argument. Yeah, but what's what does... the con concept? What does that? What, what does that keyword do? It creates a constraint for template arguments. Let me okay, sure. show you. That makes me wonder what STD convertible to looks like. So, if you're really interested, I did write an old article on this uh, in concepts. this section here, concepts. Okay. Uh, you should read the part before it because it's about the Sfine of we using enable if it's technically we kind of we don't need this anymore because now we can constrain template arguments using concepts. Um, but basically, it just it it just says in this case it just says that this constraint ensures that the from type is convertible to the to type which uses STDs convertible to, which I didn't like the naming of that, so I just created my own to, ma to match my naming convention in my, uh, my source code. But this basically says that U is allowed as long as, con as it's convertible to T. Yeah. And um, M is the, okay, M is the size, the number of parameters being passed. Should, should say, look at this. Uh, so this allows us, for example, to construct a, a vector using a vector as a copy of, like this is a vector 2f, and we can specify additional parameters for constructing a vector 4, right? So this would be, for example, 2, but if this m was also the same size as the vector, well, it would just copy the additional one and ignore the additional parameters. So the implementation first copies the elements from the first argument, which is a vector, and copies the additional arguments using what's called an unfold expression. And this is the thing I, I was trying to get, but since I'm using a, a ternary operator here, I had this syntax, but I wanted to try to figure out how to get the fold expression to work um, in the other example without the ternary operator. And that's what I'm having trouble with. So we needed some kind of counter variable And then we need to populate the base vectors elements at i and also increment i. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, sure, that should be a post increment because we want to make sure that the first value is set properly. And then I thought we could just do like this, but that's not gonna work. Maybe uh, look at chat. <laughs> Do you have the solution in chat? Yeah. Yeesh. <laughs> Damn. Oh, 26 messages in chat. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Wrap that in a in a tuple. <laughs> it's a very interesting syntax, but... Uh... Do I need the void? I don't think I need the void. Apparently, yeah. I, do, I need the void. Need the void. Still complaining. No, I need to put the Still complaining. For the comma. It's arcs. And oh, right. And so, oh, right, yeah. yeah the, okay. So, this is like a, a whack out some kind of temple, tuple, tuple using the comma operator as a, so as a hack to expand the arguments. Apparently, but it doesn't doesn't tell, tell, say me much to me. This is an example to me of C plus plus syntax just going too far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not readable anymore. You just need to know what this means. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, but it was the next questions about veridic template arguments. So um, <laughs> mileage may vary. Don't put this on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, and you can like 
fill it in with as many operators as you want. I'm going to not going to continue with more operators because you can basically extrapolate the rest of the operators with uh, this example here, I think, unless you think, okay, well, uh, how would this look for this one? Oh, and we don't need these anymore, right? Because we've now uh, moved the data type out into the base vector. So these are useless now. And now we only need to define the functions for a generic vector that has any data type t and any size n and the rest of the functions will be generated by the compiler correctly right so we can actually try this with by compiling this oh fold expressions require c++ 17 okay good to know good to know let's just go right to 20 uh yeah but default is 14 let's just go to 20 Okay. Uh, why is it private? Huh? How is it private? I didn't make it private, did I? Let's see, vector base. Oh, doi, because by default in classes, they're private. And in my example code, I believe they are structs. Hold on one second. I'm pretty sure they're structs. They're all structs. They're all structs. Okay, let's just change these to structs, which is better because then we don't have to explicitly make them private or public. Public by default in structs. Also with the specializations, uh, struct and struct. Uh, and now if we go back here and try to compile that. Yes, now it's no problem. Okay. <clears throat> so he's happy and healthy, even with my four component types, which I didn't specialize, but whatever. Um, but yeah, that's an example of using templates with specializations and all kinds of fancy stuff. Yeah, one thing we didn't get really get into are concepts, which were introduced in C++20. Uh, but we can use concepts to, uh, for example, we can constrain the template type parameter to uh, integral or floating point types or numeric types or arithmetic types more uh, more correctly. Uh, I think there's a template uh, concept called STD arithmetic, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for, F for arithmetic types. Uh, I don't know how it's called exactly, is arithmetic, uh, which returns true for arithmetic, arithmetic types, uh, like floats, uh, integral or floating point types. Um, so we can constrain the template parameters and not allow, for example, uh, booleans, <laughs> vector of bools, or any other types that we don't expect. Uh, or we can constrain um, on particular functions. So for example, if we want to overload the operator here, we can also say requires that, you know, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are, you know, you can apply the plus operator on them, or you can apply the plus operator on the individual members of the function or whatever. We can constrain on whatever function or expression we want. But that's a more complex use case as well. So I don't want to get into that uh, today, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's pretty handy to, to have, to, you know, to write your vector class once and be able to use it in whatever context you want. Uh, one more thing I want to show is aliases. Um, so you can also, you can create template aliases as well. So I could specify template arguments on an alias, but you can also say, for example, uh, vector 2f is equal to vector. Surprise, surprise, float two, or using vector three F, vector float three. Now, obviously this does not instantiate like we did here in the CPP file. These, by specifying it with the template keyword and then the type and the class type and the parameter types, that will cause the compiler to actually instantiate them and compile them or to allow us to compile it test it whether or not it's semantically syntactically correct but not semantically uh, these are just aliases so these will not instantiate the actual class type and they will not force the compiler to actually generate the code for this 
unless it's actually used somewhere in a CPP file or a file that is somehow included into a CPP file. Is that clear? Yes. So GLM types, VEC3, float3, very common type. All right, so you can use whatever. You can uh, alias as many of the variants as you want, uh, which could make your code in other places uh, much easier to read. OK, any questions? No? OK, very good. Then um, I will print it, publish it. And uh, to everybody watching the stream after, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.